as we open up God's Word, we're allowing the voice of God. We're allowing the Spirit of God to speak to us the truth of God. So when you open up your Word today and every day, know that that is taking place. You're giving God an opportunity to speak to you. So let's lean into it. Listen, this Word that we're reading today is more current than tomorrow's headlines that you're going to read tomorrow. This Word is more powerful than any virus that's taking place in our world. This word is more relevant than anything that you're going to read on social media. So let's lean into God's word today and ask him to speak to us more than ever before. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and a delight of my heart. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is speaking and he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. And Jesus says this, It is written that man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So don't be filled up with the world's bread, but be filled with God's word today. George Sweeting, he wrote a book and he tells of a man by the name of John Currier, who in 1949 was found guilty of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. Later, John was transferred and paroled to work on a farm near Nashville, Tennessee. In 1968, his sentence was terminated, and this letter bearing good news was sent to John. But John never saw the letter, nor was he told anything about it. And so he continues to be on this farm, and it was difficult. Life on this farm was hard with out promise for the future, John kept working. Even after the farmer had passed away, he continued to work. Ten years goes by. A state patrol officer, a state parole officer, excuse me, learns about Courier's plight. He finds him and he tells him that his sentence had been terminated. John was a free man. George Sweeting concludes this story by asking the reader, would it matter to you if someone sent you an important message, the most important in your life, and year after year, this urgent message was never delivered? Any one of us who has heard the good news, we've responded to Jesus, we've experienced freedom through Jesus Christ, we are responsible to proclaim that good news. We are responsible to tell other people about it. And Jesus gave us an opportunity um, to be able to do that. So in Matthew chapter 28, we'll get there in just a moment. I want to catch you up to speed on what has led up to the red letters that we're about to read. Jesus has been betrayed by Judas. He's been denied by Peter. He was arrested at night. He was tried the next day, whipped, mocked, crucified, buried. Jesus came back from the dead three days later, and now he's ministering to so many people, to his disciples. And so that's what's led up to this moment here. In Matthew chapter 28, many Bibles um, have this titled as the Great Commission. Here's what Jesus says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Three quick things that I want to point out in what Jesus has said. The first one is this. Look at the the great authority that Jesus has. In verse 18, it says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This authority, it's, it's a right to use power. The Gospels stress the authority of Jesus. Matthew, the the, the first Gospel, stresses the authority of Jesus Christ. This authority that Jesus had had been given to him from God. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, Jesus says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. In John three thirty five, Jesus says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. John thirteen three, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. Ephesians 1, verse 20 
says, which he ex exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. In John 17, verses 1 and 2, Jesus spoke these things, and he's lifting up his eyes to heaven, and he says, Father, the hour has come. Leading up through this gospel to this point, Jesus had continuously said to his disciples that his hour hadn't come. It wasn't time to be able to go through what he needed to do, but now this moment has taken place, and Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Here's what Jesus is asserting. He's asserting that he, as the Son of God, has received from the Father supreme authority in heaven and on earth over the whole kingdom of God in its fullest extents. Jesus had no weapons. He had no armies. He had no earthly treasures. He didn't have the government backing him. Yet God has given him the authority over all to Jesus. Jesus had authority in his teaching. He had authority over Satan. He had the authority when he forgave sin. He had authority in healing. And he delegated that authority to his disciples. And that also extends to you and I. Just ask those who were in the boat. When this storm rose up and Jesus calmed the storm with his words, ask those people, ask those disciples who had authority. Ask the, small, the, the boy who had a small lunch that he shared with Jesus so that Jesus could feed thousands of people. Ask that boy who had the authority there. I'm sure that the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, the man born blind, and the lepers, they had no doubt who had authority when their healing came. When the widow's son, Lazarus, or the daughter of Jairus, were raised back to life after being dead, I don't think there was any question in their minds who had the authority. And these are only a scratch of the surface of all that Jesus did, all that Jesus said, and the authority that he showed, even amongst the religious leaders and the Roman officials, they had no authority over him. William Barclay, he wrote, it's interesting to note that the means that the Jewish authorities used in their desperate attempts to eliminate Jesus, they used treachery to lay hold on him. They used illegality to try him. They used slander to charge him to Pilate. They even used bribery to silence the truth about his resurrection, and they failed. The gospel of goodness is greater than the plots of wickedness, he says. Jesus was brutally beaten, crucified. His blood was shed. He was dead for three days. He didn't stay dead, though. He rose victorious. So when Jesus says all authority has been given to him, I'm listening. This man who I saw, you know, the disciples had seen had been murdered, now is alive again, and he's teaching them, and he says all authority has been given to him. You better believe that they were leaning in, that they were listening. Jesus' resume speaks for itself. When he says that, is that not enough for us to lean in and accept his words? This authority was delegated to the disciples. In Luke chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus um, goes on and he calls the twelve together. He gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And check out verse 2. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. That's the assignment that Jesus gave them. So Jesus has all authority, and he's given the disciples and you and I these standing orders. So these standing orders, let me, standing orders, they're an instruction or procedure that's in force permanently until changed or canceled. So let me give you a quick 
few basic standing orders. So maybe you have an automatic refill of your medication at the pharmacy. And so every, every time you need to go, it's just automatically refilled until the doctors or you say, stop. Or maybe a business, they have fresh flowers delivered every um, you know, two weeks or something like that. And that's just a standing order until the, the boss calls and says no more, that's always gonna happen. Or maybe um, at home you have a day of the week that cleaning gets done and that's just a standing order. That's just when it is, when you've decided and until you say otherwise, that's just when it's gonna happen. Um, Jesus gave standing orders when he said to go and make disciples until he returns, this is our responsibility. This is what we're supposed to do. And so there's great authority, but then, starting in verse 19, there's also great responsibility. Jesus says this. Let me remind you. He says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. This word go, it really means in your going, as you go about your, your day-to-day life, as you go to work, as you're, you're with your family or whatever you're doing, in your going, make disciples. No matter where we are, you and I, we are carriers of the good news of Jesus Christ. We are carriers of the good news of Jesus Christ. So he says, in your going, make disciples. Disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. Warren Wearsby says the term disciples was the most popular name for the early believers. Being a disciple meant more than being a convert or a church member. Apprentice might be an equivalent term. A disciple attached himself to a teacher, identified with this teacher, learned from this teacher, and lived with him. He learned not simply by listening, but also by doing Our Lord called 12 disciples and taught them so that they might be able to teach other people. So a disciple not only learns and sits under a teacher, but they also go out and they make disciples. They teach others the way too. Listen, it's not enough to have converts and no disciples. The responsibility is not just conversion, it's disciples. The, the responsibility doesn't stop when someone prays a prayer to submit to Jesus. It's also teaching others to obey the Word of God. That's a responsibility that we have. Warren Wearsby goes on to say this, In many respects, we have departed from this pattern. In most churches, the congregation pays the pastor to preach, to win the loss and build up the saved, while the church members function as cheerleaders or spectators. The converts are one, they're baptized, they're given the right hand of fellowship, and then they join the other spectators. He says, how much faster our churches would grow, how much stronger and happier our churches would be if our church members would be discipling another person, discipling another believer. And i got to ask you today, who are you discipling? Who are you discipling? If you're not discipling someone, then you're not following the Great Commission because Jesus says to go and make disciples. In the midst of this pandemic, there's so much good that's happening. So many people are going out of the way to to help others, to to buy groceries, to make masks, uh, to mow their yard, uh, whatever it may be. Um, There's so much good that's happening, and so hear me today. Don't get me wrong. That's all good stuff, but I challenge you. Don't put on the back burner the Great Commission. Actually, in our going, as we're blessing people, as we're helping people, we can make disciples. We're planting seeds. During a crisis time, there's going to be some long-lasting fruit that comes from this season, and i got to encourage you that it starts in our homes. It starts with our kids so parents and grandparents it starts with us deuteronomy chapter 6 starting in verse 1 uh, pastor weaver spoke a little bit about this two weeks ago and you can go back about being intentional in our parenting here's what deuteronomy 6 says these are the commands decrees and laws the lord your god directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the jordan to possess so that you your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. 
And so that you may enjoy long life, hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. Just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Sounds a lot like Jesus saying, in your going, make disciples. Verse 8, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on the foreheads, on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. There's an intentionality that's taking place here. Discipleship will not just happen because we pray for it. Discipleship won't happen just because we're talking about it today or we read about it in the Bible. Discipleship is intentional. It's going to take work. It's going to take efforts. But I promise you it's worth it. That's why ministry to children and youth is so important. Here at New Hope, we value that. We know it's so vital. And building a foundation on Jesus as early as possible, the earlier the better. Notice baptism is a part of this discipleship process. Baptism signifies to everybody a commitment, a pledge to Jesus. Um, and this is a responsibility that's not just for the pastor, but it's a responsibility to every believer to teach about baptism and tell them about it. Um, in baptism, the believer acknowledges that God is their Heavenly Father, that Jesus is their Lord and Savior, that the Holy Spirit is the one who indwells and empowers them. Also notice that obedience to God's commandments is part of the discipleship process. Listen, the essence of discipleship is becoming like Jesus. And what other place what are we going to learn except for from His written Word to us? You need to be reading God's Word. You need to be studying God's Word on your own, plain and simple. I promise you that there is, there's a fire that happens within your spirit as you begin to read God's Word. It goes from a small kindle to a roaring fire as you read God's Word. John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. If you love Jesus, you will obey what He says. Proverbs 21, 3 says, To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Listen, we can't just give in an offering, support missions, and think that's enough. We need to be obedient to the Bible. We can't get pumped up about the latest song from Elevation Worship or Hillsong or whoever and forget that there's an obedient side to following Jesus. There needs to be obedience in our life as a follower of Jesus. Thankfully, Jesus gave some reassurance. After he spoke this great commission, Jesus has a great promise. So there's great authority. There's a great responsibility. And finally, these, there's a great promise. Look at the end of verse 20. Jesus says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Imagine what the disciples are going through. Their Lord had just been murdered and raised to life. He's told them that he's going to a place to prepare for them. They can't go with, them, with him, but he's coming back. He will return. In the meantime, Jesus needed them to make disciples. No longer were they just a disciple, but now they were also to teach others the way. Jesus promised his disciples they would not be alone in their going. He would be with them. If Jesus had remained on earth, had he remained on earth, he could not have fulfilled that, that promise. When the Holy Spirit came, that's when Jesus came to be with his people. William Barclay says it must have been a staggering thing for 11 humble Galileans to be sent forth to the conquest of the world. Even as they heard it, their hearts must have failed them. But no sooner was the command given than the promise followed. You know, the Apostle Paul, he discovered this promise to be true when he was seeking to establish a church in a difficult city of Corinth. Obeying this commission, Paul came to the city 
In Acts chapter 18, he won people to Christ. He baptized them. He taught them the word. And when times were tough, there's a a moment in verses 9 and 10 of Acts chapter 18 where Paul had a special visit from the Lord. And it says, don't be afraid. I'm with you. Jesus, by means of His Holy Spirit, promised to always be with those fulfilling His great commission. Always means all days. Days of strength as well as days of weakness. Days of success as well as days of failure. Of joy and affliction. Of liberty and temptation. Of health and sickness. Of laughter and sadness. Wealth. Poverty. Obedience and disobedience. Youth and old age. The day of new life. Of new birth. And in the day of death. Jesus promised... Always be with us. David Livingston, he was a world-renowned doctor and missionary. And by the time he returned to his native Scotland to address students at a university, the previous 16 years had been spent in the service of God on the continent of Africa. As he stood before those young men and women, the tremendous price exacted on his body was plain to see. More than 27 fevers had coursed through his veins, leaving his body emaciated and ravaged. One arm hung useless at his side, the result of being mangled by a lion. The core of David's message to those young people that day was this. Shall I tell you what sustained me amidst the toil the hardship and the loneliness of my exile, it was Christ's promise, lo, I am with you always, even until the end. Listen, you are not alone in this. Jesus promised to always be with us. It sustains the disciples. That promise sustained them. It sustained and gave strength to the Apostle Paul, to David Livingston, and to countless people who are even watching today. It can sustain you. The disciples, just like us, they were sent out with the greatest task in history. But also, we are given the greatest authoritative presence in history, that being Jesus Christ. As we wrap up and pray in just a moment, even though Jesus has authority over all, He still wants your heart. You and I, we get to decide if we're going to come under the authority of Jesus. We get to decide if we will submit to Him or not. And until, until we realize the gravity of our sin, we don't realize the need for Jesus. And so today, if you have not submitted to Jesus Christ, you have not given Him your everything, your heart. I encourage you in just a moment as I pray that wherever you're at, you would pray this prayer also, that you would agree with me. But it begins with this. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. It says, for with your heart you believe and it's with your mouth that you confess So as I pray, would you pray, pray out loud, confess Jesus as Lord today. God, I thank you for your written word. I thank you that there is a promise that you are always with us. And I pray for those today who have not given their life to you. They've not submitted to you and to your lordship, to your authority. And they're wanting to, and they're, they're confessing you right now in their homes, wherever they may be, that you are Lord. Would you meet them where they're at, Jesus? Would you fill their, their house with your presence? God, forgive them of their sin as they confess it to you. And Jesus, we know that it goes beyond just praying this prayer, but there is a a lifelong following that is about to take place. And so I pray that you would encourage them and give them the strength that you promised, the presence that you have promised them from your word as they go forth from this day. In your name we pray. Amen.
So many of us need to get back into the business of discipleship. Grandparents, parents, uncles and aunts, um, neighbors, friends, co-workers, we as followers of Jesus Christ have a responsibility, a great responsibility to make disciples. We are all in this. We all have a responsibility. The great thing is, is that Jesus is with you. He's with me. He's equipped us. He's given us His Holy Spirit. So go. Let's pray. God, we thank You for being with us always. I pray that You would encourage those today to continue to make disciples. That this, Some of us need to begin making disciples. Some of us need to resume making disciples. Whatever category we may be in today, God, I ask that you would encourage your people, that you would bless your people today, that they would remember that you are faithful, that you are with them, that you would give them the strength that they need, that the, the promise that you gave your disciples, that you gave the Apostle Paul, remind your people today that you are with them through all that they're going through. Encourage them. God, we love you and we thank you for sending your son Jesus. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this week, I encourage you to spend more time with the Lord than you did last week. And in your going, make disciples. We love you. Have a great week.